Good evening, everyone. We are so grateful to have everyone here for our conversation today. In April of 2018, two young men, Dante Robinson and Rashawn Nelson, friends since they were little boys, went to a Starbucks in Center City, Philadelphia for a business meeting with their friend Andrew Jaffe to talk about a potential real estate deal. The 23-year-olds who had patronized that location since they were 15 years old sat down to wait for their friend and then Sean got up and went to use the restroom. The 31-year-old store manager, Holly Hilton, said that they were not allowed to use the restroom because they hadn't ordered anything. And so he went back to his seat. Barely a few minutes later, police were called and they came and asked the two men to leave. They said, we haven't done anything and we're here waiting to meet our friend. At which point they were led away in handcuffs, being forced out the door with their hands behind them in cuffs just as their friend arrived in the store saying, what did they do, what did they do? In the aftermath of that difficult incident in which there were apologies from the chief of police and the mayor of Philadelphia and the CEO of Starbucks, there was that maybe there would be change. In fact, when the city of Philadelphia settled with the two young men for $1, what they expressed was that maybe this will lead to change. We've heard that term change and those expressions of hope time and time again over years and years and decades and decades. And so we have to ask ourselves simple fundamental questions. And one of those questions is, what happened to Holly Hilton? What happened in the life of that 31-year-old store manager that led her to realize that two young men who were doing nothing at all, other than waiting to meet a friend for a business meeting, her mind became a threat. What were all the things that she experienced in society? What were all the messages that she heard from those around her, her parents, her teachers, what she saw on television, what she read in the newspaper, all of the implicit and explicit messages that led her to develop a racist sense of herself in which she saw two people not as patrons not as individuals, not as 23-year-old young men, but as a threat. A threat so severe that she felt necessary to call the police to protect herself. But more important than her experience is what was the experience of growing up as Dante Robinson and Rashawn Nelson, who always wondered what would happen when they encountered the police who had to endure that very difficult day and all of the days that led up to it, what it was like to be a black young man in America. We think about what has happened in our society to lead the systemic racism that has led me to become a racist, of which I'm trying so hard to overcome, that has led so much of us to be racist, even though we don't think we're racist, because of all of the ways that systematic racism has become the dominant narrative in our society a narrative that has claimed the lives of hundreds and hundreds of people for nothing. People whose names we should never forget, like Trayvon Martin, and Batam Jean, and Tamir Rice, and Stefan Clark, and Eric Garner, and Justine Diamond, and Philando Castile, and Ahmed Arbery, and Breonna Taylor, and Jamar Clark, and George Floyd. We need to ask ourselves these crucial questions and we need to learn how to listen. We need to learn how to listen so that we can be better allies and more understanding of what it actually is to experience race in America. Temple Bethel is so blessed and so lucky that we have people in our community who have been partners with our congregation and trying to do good work for decades. And we're so grateful that three members of our community have graciously agreed to be part of a conversation to help us learn, to help us listen, to help us grow so that we can be better, that we can build a society that is more just, more inclusive, 
that is more at peace and that is the best expression of what the American ideal can possibly be. And so I wanna introduce the members of our panel who are here with us this evening. The first I wanna introduce is Pastor Ronald Brown, who is the senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. Pastor Brown is a native of South Florida and the youngest of eight children. He is blessed to have both of his parents still alive as the proud father of four with three grandchildren. And he holds a bachelor's of science degree and master's degree and has deep rooted passion for community and unity among all of God's children. And it's his goal and desire to lead the charge against racism and division. Second member of our panel is Wayne Barton. Wayne Barton is a retired police officer who grew up just south of Boca Raton in Deerfield Beach and saw the lack of role models firsthand, which became his inspiration to help serve our community. He was a member of the Boca Raton Police Force where most of his many goals was to give the streets back to the people who lived there. Until Wayne came on the scene, drug dealers and gangs owned the streets, working adults and children had to live with this every day. And during his 20 years of service, he received multitude of commendations from business and community leaders all the way up to the president of the United States. After his retirement, he stayed in our community and built the Wayne Barton Study Center where he has been able to give kids and families what they couldn't afford, school supplies, help with rent, a ride to the grocery store, and good grades and opportunities to achieve a college education. You visit the Wayne Barton Study Center, you will be blessed to see all of the banners of all the schools that all the young men under Wayne's wing have launched to be able to study and to enjoy. He wanted to reinforce to kids that hard work and dedication has rewards. And so it is that he has worked for so many years to make such an important difference in the life of our community here in Boca Raton. And the third member of our panel is Dana Pina. Dana Pina, among many things, is a mother of three, of Caleb, who just graduated from high school and is heading off to Carleton College in Minnesota, her daughter, Kara, and her daughter, Koi. She received her bachelor's in nursing and biology from Florida Atlantic University, and recently a master's in social work from Florida State University. She was raised in a Southern Pentecostal family, but in 2013, she and her family chose to formally convert to Judaism, answering her soul's call to return home, and has been an active and important member of our congregation since joining at that time. We are so grateful for all three of you to be here tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Rabbi Jessica Mates, to uh, help us begin our conversation. Thank you, Rabbi Levin, Dana, and Wayne, and Pastor. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We wanted to start tonight where you want to start, to have you talk about your personal values, beliefs, and address the issues that touch you personally and what you want to share about your capacity and your role that you feel is most important in this time. And we'll go in the order that Rabbi introduced you, um, Pastor, then Wayne, then Dana. Amen, amen. I'm Pastor Brown and I just like to say, I, I am deeply rooted in South Florida. I'm a native as stated. I uh, went to Plantation High School, and I know a little bit about diversity. I was actually on the wrestling team there, and I was the only, only Black individual that was on the team. But the thing that's important about that is the entire time that I was on the team, I, I never saw color. I never was mistreated. But the fact is, there is still then and still now that elephant that's in the room that we for so long have walked around and just pretend or act like it did not exist. But now we have come to a time. We've come to a time to where there's no way that we could possibly allow ourselves to walk beyond or around that elephant in the room. It has to be addressed. And we know, we know, each of us know that racism is alive and well in our country, our cities, our law enforcement agencies, government. We know that. And I began to think about this and, and having this panel tonight and thinking about all the names that was called off of the individuals that have been murdered or killed. 
I think about Emmett Till. I think about Dr. King. I think about Malcolm X. I think about Marcus Garvey, Trayvon Martin. And the list goes on and on. And the thing about it is, it's not, if we can be very real with each other, it's not going to stop. So I think it's time for us to stop blaming, yes, yes, there are good police officers and bad police officers, but the police officers are not the ones that have to bring about the change. The change have to start and we, we are the ones that have to bring about the change. We are the ones that's gonna be on the front line in our churches, in our communities, our families. We are the ones that's gonna to have to stand up and say enough is enough. All of us should be afforded the right to breathe. We should all stand up and realize that we are all God's children. We might not all look alike or come from the same place, but we are still, we are still God's children. And all of us deserve the same right as each other. I deserve no more than you or you no more than me. I love the fact that we can come together like this. And I know, and I know I, I'm a, at firsthand knowledge because on holidays, Christmas, New Year's, birthdays, guess what? My family table looked like the UN. My, my sister's date and inter have interracial husbands, boyfriends, my nephews. So I, I'm used to this. And the thing about it is when we get together, oh, what a time we have. We sit there, we laugh, we enjoy, we embrace, cry together. We, we do everything that a family is supposed to do together. And that's what we have to work on. We have to continue to work on this family this family, this family that we have been blessed to be in. And this is another strange, a very, very real point, a very real point because we have to have real conversations. These, the young kids today, the young kids today, we have to make sure because the young kids today will not tolerate, will not tolerate the things that went on in the 60s and the 70s and even the 80s. And I'll tell you a reason why. Because they are all intermingled. They're all friends. They're dating each other. The families together. We have to make sure we have, we have not did a good enough job of setting, setting an example. But now this is our time. This is our opportunity. And if we don't take the opportunity now, if we don't take the opportunity now to set some standards or set some goals of not being divided. We have to make sure, make sure that we're standing on the right side. And we, when we have to stand for something, we have to stand for right. And that's it. There's no in between, there's no gray areas. It's standing for what's right. You have to stand for me, I have to stand for you. Because it just might be, it just might be, Next week or next month or next year, your family member might find someone knee on their necks. So we have to come together now and do what we're doing, dialoguing, coming together, loving on one another and making sure, making sure that we discuss the issues that need to be discussed and start avoiding that elephant that's in the room. Thank God Boca Raton have not been it with uh, a tragedy as of yet. But thanks by the grace of God, because it could be us. We could be next. So we have to set standards now that everyone have to follow by. There has to be balance and check, balance and checks. There has to be that in order for us to move on and to progress. Amen. Amen. Amen, Wayne. It gives me great pleasure to be here with you guys, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, hopefully, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, okay good. Uh, it just gives me great pleasure to be here with you guys, because you know Temple Bethel is like my family. And for many years, we have worked together in the community. But I just want to share a little story with you as me 
growing up as a black male in the city of Deerfield Beach, uh, growing up and seeing the racism and the strong prejudice behavior as a child. And then I'll bring you to Boca Raton where I became a police officer and uh, share those uh, life experience there. And then I'll bring it to a close. But I want to start about the city of Deerfield Beach would celebrate for many years the Cracker Day celebration. And as a child, I really didn't know what that meant. But when I received the award of uh, the Thousand Points of Light, uh, the father of George W. Bush uh, picked the thousand people in the world that made a difference all around the world. And it's called the Thousand Points of Light. And I was chosen as 241. And I went to the White House and I stayed in the White House for a whole week and I slept in Lincoln's bedroom. What a great honor that was. And uh, I remember the president of the United States asking me, so what do you think, Wayne? You have made it to the White House. And I said to him at dinner that the greatest thrill for me would be if my parents were still alive to see their little boy make it to the White House. When I returned back to Boca Raton, I received a call from the city of Deerfield, and I take it that he was a participant. I, didn't, I don't recall his name. And he called me and he said, Wayne, would you please participate as the Grand Marshal in our, grand, in our Cracker Day celebration? And I said to him, I said, sir, do you realize I'm Afro-American? He said, yes. He said, we're proud of you. You went to the White House. We want you to be the grand marshal in our parade. And as I got older, I understand what the Cracker Day celebration was all about. And I was really terribly disturbed. It's where the white man uses a crack, uh, cracker, which, uh, which it would be the whip on the slave. And that was a celebration. Now in the city of Deerfield, they call it Founders Day. And I had to explain to him, I said, you know, I have to decline on this offer. There's no way I can see myself sitting in a parade at Grand Marshal as an Afro-American celebrating the humility that you brought to us for 245 years without a paycheck. And he says he was really upset that I turned his offer down. And, he, and what I learned from that conversation is that we have had scales on our eyes for so many years. And we've been living that lifestyle, and we really don't understand when we're wrong. I couldn't get that gentleman to understand what was wrong about that offer. But he finally said to himself, I give up. I, I tried. And I, I share with him that someday, I hope before you leave this earth that you will realize why I refuse the opportunity to participate in the Cracker Day celebration in the city of Deerfield Beach. I couldn't support that. And I share that story with you because there's a lot of people in society today that I've encountered in the city of Boca Raton that have scales on their eyes. They really have lived a lifestyle for so many years, and they don't realize that their behavior is racist behavior and is unacceptable. A lot of Afro-Americans today would take it and would turn the other cheek. They would hold their head down and they would move on and they wouldn't hold on to it. As a police officer in the city of Boca Raton, I documented 21 years of racism within the agency. Of course, I can't talk about it in detail because of the court order. But I can tell you this, that being an Afro-American police officer in the city of Boca Raton, there are some issues. There's some very concerning issues, not only in the agency, but also in the city, where people just do not, do not receive Afro-Americans well. I was in Kmart on West Palm Auto Park Road one day in plain clothes, and I could hear them saying K5 to aisle three. I looked up and I was on aisle three that was telling security to go to house three and observe me. And he, he continued to continue to have me under surveillance. And finally he got the courage to approach me as I was walking up the aisle. 
and I was able to produce my police ID. I said, my name is Wayne Bart, and I'm a police officer in Boca. He was so embarrassed that he really didn't know what to do, say to me. Again, being an Afro-American in the wrong place at the wrong time, you can be a victim of someone prejudiced behavior. I'm not saying that there are some people who really get what I'm saying. There are some people that get what I'm saying. There's some people that don't get what I'm saying. But I'm, I'm telling you, the pain is so great. It almost literally, when I talk about it, it just makes you want to cry. Because I don't think about Wayne. I think about my, my grandkids and the kids that I work with in the community that can't be as vocal, can't be as articulate and tell their pain. All you see is anger and frustration, and you hear them crying, and they're trying to tell you their pain. I think that's where we're at in 2020. It's been almost 400 years, 245 years without a paycheck. And it describes our pain. It's so fortunate now it's brought it to the forefront that people are willing to listen. And there are people who really get the pain of being Afro-American and being charged with you're guilty when you're not guilty. When you're in the wrong place at the wrong time and people will prosecute you on the scene, not a judge and jury, even police officers. Corey Davis, when he took the gun out, he stopped him on the side of the road in Palm Beach County. His car broke down. He was calling triple A. A cop came up in plain clothes and he killed him. He killed this young man for no reason. You don't know what it's like to walk in the shoes of a black man or a black woman until you really sit down and do what we're doing tonight. My pain is great. My tears run down my face when I see that behavior of racism. It goes beyond the superficial of what you see. It goes deep down and rooted, and you get to see the anger by looting and rioting and breaking windows and all this. I don't support that. But I'm telling you, the pain is so great. Sometimes you just don't know what to do and where to turn. And when you turn to the police or you turn to somebody and you tell them, they look at you and say to you, I've heard your story before. I don't want to hear it anymore. And said that, I just hope tonight that somebody that's listening will hear the cry or Afro-American and understand and be educated. There's no pain like the pain of racism and to be discriminated against because the color of your skin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dana. Evening, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start um, by saying that I am extremely grateful um, for this opportunity, and I'm grateful for all of the people that thought that this was important enough to be here. I feel like you've done your part to to be willing to listen, and my role is to share and to try to bring you into my experience. So um, I'm a mother of three children, as uh, Rabbi Dan mentioned. I have a son. And I've been walking around for the last two weeks with a lump in my throat and um, anguish in my gut. But I want to be clear that um, George Floyd's murder wasn't the beginning of it for me. It was the tipping point for sure. And it, it definitely sent me over the edge, but it wasn't the beginning. Um, most black parents in this country have the talk, what we call the talk with our kids and it starts early. Um, when I was asked to participate in this, Rabbi Dan asked me, what do you want us to know? We need to listen and we, we need to know what is it that you want us to know? 
And it took me a while to really sit with my feelings and drill it down, but I think I came up with a pretty concise list of things I want you to know. So here we go. First, anger is a secondary emotion. It's usually the root, at the root of it is fear or sadness or hopelessness. And what we're seeing erupt all over the world now um, isn't just people being angry for anger's sake. And I need people to understand that. Anger is secondary. Anger is, we're seeing frustration, we're seeing desperation, but at the root of that is fear and sadness and hopelessness. Secondly, um, as a black mother in this country, every day I am afraid that I'll get a phone call. Not because my son was hanging out with the wrong crowd, not because he was out in the streets late at night or um, in the wrong place at the wrong time, but just because I birthed him into this world with dark skin. That's it, that's all it takes. Um, I looked at pictures of him as a child and I posted one recently on Facebook to, for this reason. Um, and I've looked at the, the pictures sometimes and wondered when did he switch from being cute to being a threat? Because he was a cute little black boy with, with, with braids and everybody thought he was cute everywhere we went. And at what point did he switch? And most black mothers ask themselves that question. I've had this conversation with lots of people um, that have asked themselves that question. And I know the answer. It was right around 10 years old. That's when he stopped being cute. I know this because he was walking a friend home. He was maybe three houses down from our house. And he was stopped by a sheriff's officer who asked him, what are you doing in, in this neighborhood? Because in his mind, he didn't belong in that kind of neighborhood. He was 10. He was in elementary school. And that's when I knew he's not cute anymore. Now he's a black man. At 10, he became a black man. Um, I've also looked at pictures of my son now and as handsome as I think he is, and as wonderful and brilliant as he is, I looked at pictures and wondered, is this the one that I would use to give to the news stations if he was next? Is this the picture I would give them? Which funny story about him would I tell in that first press conference? And no mother should ever have to ask herself that. <clears throat> um, next, I want to be clear that this issue is not political. I could not care less who you vote for. This is an issue of life and death. This is an issue of equality and Although we all live in this same community, and specifically to my um, fellow Jews, we're all a part of the same community, Jewish community, we don't have a shared experience in this respect. <clears throat> that said, I think people mean well, but don't understand um, the pain that arises when you're told, oh, I totally understand where you're coming from because anti-Semitism is everywhere and I'm Jewish and you're Jewish and we're persecuted. And so I totally get it. You don't, you don't. And be glad that you don't. This is not a club you want to be in. And it's, it feels dismissive to say, I totally get it, you're just like me. I'm not. It's not the same. 
Next. Um, I just want to, I just want to say I've been feeling really hopeless lately and that's kind of new for me because generally I'm not naturally an optimistic person, but I generally can, because of my relationship with God, my spirituality, I have, I have been able to, for the most part, um, hold on to hope. With the exception of the last couple of weeks, because this is probably the most hopeless I've felt in a long time. So I wanted to share something with you. Um, I was raised Pentecostal. I'm sorry about my lighting. I don't know what's happening. I apologize. Um, I was raised Pentecostal and there's an old gospel song. I'm not going to sing it, <laughs> but I did want to share um, a couple of the lines. Um, the song says, I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy, but I don't believe he brought me this far just to leave me. And um, that song came up for me today and it really renewed a little bit of hope that he didn't bring us this far to leave us and that there is the possibility of change. And I think having this conversation being open about um, these things and being willing to understand and to listen and to do a lot of self-reflection and self-evaluation is how we will eventually get to that change. So thank you again for this opportunity. And I yield the- uh, that, um, Thank you all three of you for those really, really important words. Um, I'm, I'm holding all of that. Uh, as best I can. I wanted to ask uh, if you, there's, there's uh, probably one of the most famous Jewish expressions is why is this night different from all other nights? And uh, we ask that question every year on Passover, but I'm curious to know uh, if you think this moment is somehow different. Why is it, do you think that the nation's reaction to the killing of George Floyd has gripped the nation in almost every municipality in such uh, arduous and passionate ways. And do you think that there is a difference in the moment in which we find ourselves that points towards a meaningful sense of progress or how do you feel about how we are experiencing this moment? Um, I'm gonna ask, uh, Wayne to go first on this one, and then uh, Dana, and then Pastor Brown. Thank you, Rabbi. I, I think it's different because the population of participation from the white community, uh, the crime, the offense is no different. Historically, blacks have been at the victim of the hands of local police departments, unarmed, armed, uh, a lot of people have died, but the the participation of the overwhelming of white people who have stood up and came out after seeing the video. I think it's something about seeing that video, and we can go reel the reel in our head and play it many a times. And we 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 look at that video, and we begin to put our loved one there, or we put ourselves there. And we're saying, how could an individual put his hands in his pockets and put his knee on someone's head who's begging for life, who's saying that I can't breathe, my stomach is hurting, and, 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 and I'm, I'm taking my last bowel movement, I'm dying, and I'm crying out for my mother. If anybody and society has any way of a heart. That's what changed people. Rabbi, it's one thing to tell the story and not be heard, but tell the story and it's been recorded. If you look at historically of all the death that police at the hands of police, people have complained and complained. It wasn't until the cell phone came available 
and they start recording police officers' behavior. They made the lie a truth. If it didn't happen in the video, it didn't happen. And that became the truthful tool that made the police officer accountable for his or her actions. I think that's what changed this incident opposed from many other incidents. It's accountability. You can't deny the fact that you would videotape on your actions and your actions was not legal and it wasn't appropriate. So when you see it for yourself, it makes you get up out your chair and say, what can I do? What can, how can I help? How can I help this black community? And, I, and I've heard their cry in the past, but I've heard it, but I didn't hear it. That's what makes a difference. Thank you, Dana. Um, so I agree with uh, Mr. Barton in that I think the outrage and the participation of white Americans and white people all over the world now um, has made a difference because those voices tend to be um, deemed more valuable than voices of black people. And I think I think there's another aspect of that, which is that this wasn't just um, everybody. When Trayvon Martin died, um, there was a thing on social media where you wear, we all put on hoodies and took a picture in our hoodie, right? And it was, is, which is, and I did it. Um, and there have been a number of deaths, because I see what happened a couple weeks ago was no different than the death of Emmett Till. I put them on the same page, let's be clear. Um, but, the, and there have been many, many deaths since Emmett Till to George Floyd, up to the point of George Floyd that went um, unnoticed. They went through their little couple day news cycle in the, the social media blast, and then it was over. And I think for this situation, there has been a spirit of enough is enough. I think there has been a spirit of, okay, I'm over this now. Okay, this is, we can't, we just can't do it anymore. This is enough. It's enough. As Mr. Barton said, to hear, and I did not watch the video. So in, in full disclosure, I've had it described to me. I purposely have not watched it and I won't. Um, but what has been described to me was, um, that a grown man was calling his mom. And that, uh, more than the knee, the sight of the knee, because I've seen the still images, a grown man lying on the ground calling for his mama. I think, as it has been said, if that doesn't move you, there's something wrong with you. If that doesn't make you say, okay, you know what? Enough is enough then nothing will. We've had children, we've had adults, we've had men, we've had women. There, it's, it's enough is enough. And I think the spirit of enough is enough has risen up. And I, I do see a difference in this situation. And I do think that um, this may be the time that it changes or that it starts to change. At least I hope so. Thank you, Dana. Pastor. Yes. That is a powerful question. How is this different? Um, and I must say, you know, for the ones that lost their loved ones, it's not different. Because a loss of a child, the loss of a loved one, no one wants their child to be the one to make a difference through death. Um, so in that sense, it's not different. But as was stated, through social media, into racial relationships, 
that's where I think the difference has come, come in at. Because as Mr. Barton said, if it had not been for the cell phone, if it had not been for the social media blast all over, then I don't know if we would have had the response that we are having now. If it had not been for body cams, we might not have response that we're having now. But as I opened, I spoke about that elephant in the room. And truthfully, truth be told now, I think it's getting much, much more attention because of the fact that everyone within the next 20, 15, 20 years is probably gonna have a brown family member. The world is becoming more and more of a melting pot every day. So now, if we want to categorize people as black, white, whatever, it's a great chance and possibility that there will be a white family that will be in this situation. I have my youngest son. Well, my daughter is the youngest, but my son. And you don't know the feeling. When your son called, because both I have two of them that's in college now in Tallahassee. When I get that phone call, I look at it and I want to say, I'm so happy that he called. I want to speak to him, but I'm I'm para, I'm, I'm petrified that something has happened. He called me and said, Dad, I'm going to the march. And 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 even though we was having a march on just, just past Saturday, I almost wanted to tell him, son, don't go. Because I was afraid of what could have happened. When they see my son, 6'2", good looking, has a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in psychology, and we just accept that North Carolina, University of North Carolina for the doctoral program. But they don't see that. They won't see that when they see my son. They're gonna see a tall, six foot two, Young man, much like a lot of young kids now, won't comb their hair like they should, <laughs> and they're gonna they're gonna classify him as a problem, not knowing who he is and what he stands for. So I say that the difference the difference is that it got a lot more media coverage, and a lot of in in as the old saying. There's more people have skin in the game now. There's more people that have skin in the game now because, you know, it's a good chance that a black person has a best friend that's a white person, or a white person has a best friend that's a black person, or they're dating black or white. It's a it's a great chance, a great possibility of that. And I say it again: the young kids in today, today's time. They're not going to stand for the racism of the past. It is a time for change. It must change. And if we are not part of the change, we are part of the problem. So there's no way around it right now. As I said, if we don't make the change, it's on us. We can't go out and blame because what would make the police officers stop doing what they have been getting away with for years and years and years and years. Racism didn't just break, just jump up. It's been here and it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. So we have to continue to look deep down within ourselves and perpetuate the change. We have to be the change agent. Yes, police officers, they're here. They're trained to, protect, to patrol and protect and to serve. But how do you how do you go in and just totally straighten up an entire police department? You can't. If we don't do this now, there's going to be much more uprising, much more protesting. And the worst part about it is it's going to be a lot of innocent families hurt, a lot of loved ones lost. And I hope and pray that we don't be sitting here having the same discussion six months, 
one year or two years later. Because I have, I have my sons and my grandkids, and I would just hate to think what it would be like to get a phone call. I'm like Wayne. I'm like Wayne. It tears my heart out. It tears my heart out to see the fear in young boys' eyes. I had a young man tell me that the police was behind him. They turned the lights on and he actually started crying before they got to him. And when they got to him, fortunately, the police officer just said, I just want to let you know your tail light was out. And the police officer was nice. He said, I'm not even going to give you a warning or anything, just get it fixed. But the young man had tears in his eyes. He was crying because he was so afraid that he was going to get killed. My God. He was so afraid that he was going to get killed. And he was supposed to be going back to college in two weeks. So how is it different? There's not much, there's not much difference until we make the difference. Thank you. I was thinking, Wayne, as you were talking, Dana, as you were talking, Pastor, as you were talking, I was thinking about Bloody Sunday. And what was talked about at that time, that if it weren't for those TV cameras being present at Bloody Sunday and the images that we saw from Selma on the Sunday evening news that week, that there may not have been the success of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. But that was over 50 years ago. And we're here more than half a century later saying in many ways the exact same thing. Thank God for the cell phones. If it wasn't for the cell phones, we wouldn't even have known about it. And yes. I'm also aware of the fact that it was in many ways the same, it was the same institution. It was the local police who were involved in the events of Bloody Sunday and who were involved in the killing of George Floyd, who were involved in the killing of Breonna Taylor. And I wanna ask the hard question about policing. I want to ask about policing at the national level, and I want to ask about policing at the local level. Um, before I ask my question, though, I do want to remind all of our participants that if you have a question for the panelists to please put it into the chat box. And with the time we have as our, as our conversation moves to conclude in a bit, we will ask a few of those questions as well. So my question really is about as the three of you come to come to this conversation from different places, right? One is a religious leader, one is a religious person and a healthcare worker, and one is a former police officer who now serves his community in a different way. I would love to hear each of you talk a little bit about the relationship that you have with the police and that what we should be thinking about what policing looks like now and what it ought to look like. We're hearing calls for defunding the police and what that might mean. And so I'm gonna ask if we can go in this order. Dana, if you wouldn't mind responding first and then Pastor and then Wayne. Okay. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, despite um, the fact that these kinds of killings have been going on for a while, um, I have not until recently feared the police. Now I do. <laughs> now I do. Um, I have been afraid when I saw the red and blue lights behind me. I have been on road trips and, and I routinely pray whenever we start a road trip anyway. Um, but I've said a couple extra prayers, just like, don't let us get a flat tire. Please just don't let us run out of gas in the wrong place. Just don't, nothing. Because um, as was mentioned earlier, Corey Jones, his car broke down. He wasn't doing anything. He was waiting for AAA. I don't have the luxury of believing that it happens to those people over there and not to me because my, my brother was friends with Corey Jones. Um, so I know what can happen if you just break down on the side of the road. I am, I was thinking yesterday about um, what I would do if I needed to call the police. Because I don't, I don't, I don't want to get political, but I'm not into defunding the police. I think they're here for a reason. And does the system need an overhaul? Absolutely. Um, but they're here for a reason. The dream would be that they actually do what they're supposed to do, which is to protect. Um, but you can't have the people protecting you that are the ones you're scared of. <laughs> so um, I actually was thinking about it yesterday and 
And I thought to myself, if I have to call the police again, if I ever have to call 911, would they honor my request if I specifically asked for them to send me a black police officer? I don't even know if that's a thing. I don't even know if you're allowed to do that. I also think it's ridiculous that it's something I had to think about. <laughs> that is a question I had to ask. But I'm terrified of needing help. And the people that are supposed to help end up being the ones that, that cause me harm or cause my family. I don't know what the answer is. I know that things need to change. And I know that police, I know, I know many police officers that are amazing people. And I won't, I think in painting all police officers with one evil brush, we're doing the same thing that racism does. So that's not helpful either. Um, and I, and I don't know what needs to, I know that there needs to be an absolute overhaul of the system. I know that police departments need to have more checks and balances and there need to be people in power that understand racism, perhaps deliberate efforts to bring in city racial consultants, if you will. Um, but anytime you have, there are still so many police departments that are all white or all white, mostly white. Um, and if you're in that kind of homogenous environment and nothing is being checked and nothing's being called out, it will never change. So, um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but those are my few thoughts. I think uh, as far as the relationship with the police, I think for a black man, for a black young man, black boy, black child, it starts at, at birth before you even encounter a police officer. It started with me, with my father. When I was a young kid, I'm, I mean, I'm going back to first, first grade, second grade, when we used to take road trips. And I'll never forget it. We was coming back from Ocala. And it started the trip probably about uh, five o'clock or so in the evening. And my father was making sure that we had enough gas and make sure everybody go to the restroom and make sure we had enough food because we can't stop. And, and I asked him, I said, well, dad, why can't we stop? And he said, well, son, you, you, it would be nightfall and you don't want to stop along the road traveling. And he was trying to keep from telling me that a black person can't stop and go to the restroom or go to the store or get something to eat or you, you just never know. And I didn't, I didn't realize until later what he was doing. He was trying to protect me, but so you relate our relationship with the police starts even at that type of an age and it goes on. And then as we see, we see the unbalance of, of the truths of life, then that kind of add or subtract. I've been blessed not to have any bad run-ins with the police department, but I've seen so much. I've seen so much that did. And some of them, um, some of them deserve to have certain situations but 80% did not. And I, I want to say this about the police department. The police department is, is ready to rush in and, and arrest someone or, or, or all of these hard things that they must do. But the police department in the black neighborhood, in the black neighborhood, the police department know every single drug house that there is. They know every single corner that people are loitering on the street, just hanging out. They know every single thing, but do they do anything about it? No, no. But if you just go on the west side farther enough, if you drop a piece of paper on the ground, they will arrest you for it. So the balance is just not there. The balance is just not there. You mean to tell me you can let someone sell drugs 
in the park, in the, in the, in the neighborhood, and you know about it, you pass by them and wave, but let somebody sell loose cigarettes and you choke them to death. The balance, the balance is what we must fight for. The balance is what we must fight for. And as far as defunding the police department, no, I don't, I don't go along with that. I do go along with checks and balances. I do go along with that. But we need to put as much, as much funds as we can into the police department to assure everybody, everybody is protected. But there must be, there must be a citizen review board or, or, or whatever we have to do to get the community more involved with the policing get more involved with the policing because nowadays someone has to police the police and you can't expect for the police department to chastise their own because it's going to hurt them so you have to have some civilians you have to have some civilians available and on a board to where there's checks and balances and making sure that those checks and balances are being met. Again, we are the ones that have to lead the charge. We have to be the ones that lead the charge because if we don't, we're going to continue to get the list. It's going to continue to add up and add up and add up. It'll be someone else's child, someone else's child until it hit us on our doorstep. Pastor, I thank you for those great words. I, I, my opinion is, being a retired police officer, we must start when they first hire them. The candidate for to become a police officer, you fill out an application, you go through a hiring process where you get an interview, you have a psychological test that uses approximately eight hours. You would have to implement that process, you got to change that whole process. You need to look at these candidates for police officers at the beginning of their career, not at the end of the career. You got to look at the police academy. What is being taught in the police academy? What are they doing for his training? Because when they, once they complete the police, police academy, they put that product on the screen. And whatever they learn in that and training, field training officer, that is how they pretty much conduct themselves. So my recommendation is to start at the beginning of the applicant's career, not at the end, and try to change something that's been practicing it for 15 years. Look at the training, the sensitivity training. The sensitivity training is always given to police officers when they're made of mistakes. It becomes a discipline thing. So when they go sit in a class, and this is for one who has taught the class, it becomes a punishment. So you get a lot of resistance. That training, sensitivity training, needs to be for all police officers. And it needs to be mandatory training. And the diversity training needs to be every chance they have training to try to sensitize or desensitize one's behavior. I recommend also that they would do a a citizen review board that the citizens you can put together this board and you'll put police officers on the board and probably a union rep and when the officers step out of line this discipline will be dictated from this community review board as a how to deal with that officer you're given a community in a sense of a sense of an empowerment to have some say so and if they deemed necessary for that officer to pull his license or her license so that she don't be disciplined in the agency of the city of Boca Raton and go down to the city of Delray or Deerfield and get on another agency and carry out that behavior. You, you can't put them on a list. You got to pull the license to become a police officer. Training, more training, and more training. When it comes to the funds from the police department, they have something called law enforcement trust fund. That is a fund in every agency and a lot of people don't know about it. 
when you arrest a drug dealer, you seize his property or her properties, you seize that money, and it all goes into this fund. That fund should be used. It's a Florida State statute. It can't be used for police toys, a new car, more guns, a gun range. It has to go to a 501c3 in the community. A lot of people don't know about that. The city of Boca Raton has it. The Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office have it. The city of Delray has it. Whenever you seize drug monies or property, you have to give that money back to a 501c3 in your community. If you don't ask, you don't know about it, the agencies don't make those funds available. So when it comes to defunding the police officers and the police department, uh, I can say look at their budgets and see where they can tighten up the belt, but take those monies and put it in a program that's where it's gonna be proactive to prevent kids from being incarcerated and, and provide some type of training for our young people to know how to conduct yourself when you come in contact with a police officer. You get stopped by a police officer, you put your hand on the 10 o'clock uh, of the steering wheel and two o'clock. You don't reach in your glove compartment. You don't reach up under the, the, the seat of your vehicle. You don't make any aggressive move to justify why he or she is going to shoot you and kill you. Our kids don't know. They don't know what to do. So we have to start training our kids. If it's in high school, if it's in middle school, we need to start training our children how to receive a police officer. And we have to train our police officers how to conduct themselves when they encounter your youth. But there's much, much funding out there that we can look at that the police department has. And again, if they tighten up their belt, okay, they don't buy a police car. They, they cut back on five police cars. And, and each police car, when it's all decked out with all the lights and sirens and the blow whistles, it says $50,000. Five times 50000 that money could go to a program that could train our children how to stay alive. These are the things that we can look at. But until we, as a whole, as an agency, as a city government, as this community say, we need to look at ourselves and how can we go? How can we come together? And what the problem with all this, Rabbi, and the problem that I have is that we as an agency, we as a city government has to buy into it and we all first got to come to the table and be honest, we have a problem. Until we honestly say we have a problem, you're never going to move forward with it. And the city of Boca Raton, they got problems, and they know they have problems. Every agency has it, not just the city of Boca Raton. Everyone has it. And when you come to the table and you honestly say we have a problem, and then you come together and say we're willing to commit, as we put together that march a couple weeks ago, a week ago, Minister Charles called me and said he needed a podium. And I said, call the police department. They have podiums throughout the agency in the training department or in the briefing room. They can push a podium out. We can use it, and we can push it back in the police department. He called a particular captain. The captain, he, he put the request in with the captain, and the captain said to him, I'll see what I can do. And Minister Charles called me and said just that. He said, the captain said he'll see what he can do. I said, what do you mean he'll see what he can do? They got several podiums in the police department. They can't let us use one. They say they want to participate. They're supporting the, the event. They can't push a podium outside and let us use it. They got to think about it, and they'll get back with you. I said, why don't you, Minister Charles, give the mayor a call and let him know the dilemma that you're running into. He called the mayor. The mayor office called him back and said, the city of Broker Tone don't have a podium that they can lend you. And I told Minister Charles, I said, you know, 
Don't get caught up on the podium, but get caught up in the participation. If everyone says they want to support this march and they want to be a part of it, either you in or you out. You can't tell me that the city of Boca Raton and all the community centers that they have don't have one podium that we could use for this march. So I said to him, I have podiums at the Wayne Barton Study Center. I have many podiums. But Mr. Charles, I wanted you to walk through this to understand until everyone buys into it and be honest. I'm supporting change. It is time for me to accept change. It's a time for me to accept responsibility. Change will never, ever come about. We got to be honest. As the rabbi said earlier when he opened up, he says, I'm dealing with some racist issues that I have. That's being honest. Let's not be in denial anymore. We can't sweep this under the rug anymore. There's a rug and a lump in the rug that we can't overcome. When you call the fire department and you say my house is on fire, you can't ask for a white fireman or Afro-American fireman. Your house is on fire and you're in so much pain. All you want is relief. And that's the way the Afro community is right now. Our lives are on fire. We're asking that you send help. You send help right away because we need it. We don't care who you send. We don't care what it looks like. We just want help. Help us so we can help ourselves. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Wayne, so much. I, I, so this is hard. This is hard. It's really hard. And I think the most important thing that you can do when you have to deal with hard is to tell the truth right away. Yes. Yes. That climb over a tall mountain is to start walking. And the only way to do it is to say, this is the path and I'm going to follow it until I get where I need to go. I think one of the things also is that the, the issue is not just the police department. The issues are all over our society in the justice yes. system in total. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Elka Sparks Peterson, who teaches criminal justice at Appalachian State University, reminded me this week that Tanya McDowell, who was uh, a black woman who lied about the school district that she was in so that the school given a sentence for lying of five years. And Felicity, who paid $15,000 to an SAT administrator to cheat on her daughter's test so her daughter could get into a better college, was sentenced to 14 days in jail. And I think so long as we look at things with a different lens for someone of a different hue, we are going to still continue to have to deal with all of the elements of systemic racism in our country. With all the pain that we've unearthed and, and expressed today, and I'm so grateful that you feel safe enough with our congregation community to say what needs to be said, I'd like to ask, what gives you hope? I think hope is, uh, and Dana, you talked a little bit earlier about how you were wondering whether you could hold on to hope. And I know that that's a difficult question to ask in the midst of everything that we're wading through in this moment. But I would ask uh, first Pastor Brown and, and then Dana and then Wayne, um, what is it, if anything, that gives you hope that we can uh, see a better tomorrow? Great question, thank you. Uh, what gives me hope? First of all, the God that I serve gives me hope. And, and second of all, I, I after the march this past Saturday, I was really blown away because I was inside the church, which is Ebenezer, which is where it started. And I came outside, I looked, I saw a few people. But then I went back in the church to my office and I came out not even, not even 10 minutes after that. And I came out, I saw hundreds of people. 
and they just kept coming and coming. And even when Wayne got up to speak, he looked around and he said, wow, it's more white people here than black. And, and, and he was true, it was true. And we, we marched, we marched. And we was together, solidarity. And when we started that march, we asked everyone to be silent for eight minutes and 46 seconds, which is the length of time that the knee was on his neck. And as we left out of Ebenezer's parking lot, turned down to Federal Highway, you did not hear anyone say anything. It, it was like it was a silent cry. And we was all unified. We was all together for one cause, for one purpose. And when the countdown came, five, four, three, two, one, then everybody cried out, mother, mama, just like he called his mother. What gives me hope is for us to come together. What gives me hope is for the adults, the parents to come together to let our children see that we can get it right. It's not too late for us to get it right. What gives me hope is for everyone to reach out. And if I have anything that you need, if I can have the cause, it's my obligation and my duty to share it. And if you have anything I need that can help the cause or to save a life, it's your opportunity, it's your, you know, your responsibility to do it and share it as well. Because no one, no one will do, no one can do this by themselves. Ever Einstein said, what is the definition of insanity? Continue to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. We have to change the way we do things. Martin Luther King had a dream. And guess what? We are, we are the dream, but we are allowing the world to turn that dream into a nightmare. So we have to control the dream. We have to manufacture new dreams. But we cannot keep coming up with these fly by night, fly by night plans. We have to stick to our guns stick to our purpose, stick to our God, and that will be the only thing that will give our young people hope. Because it's not hope for me. I'm hoping for my grandchildren, my children, the generation to come after me. That's my hope. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as I stated earlier um, in my um, intro, the song um, that came up for me ended with, I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me. And the only thing that gives me hope, there are two things. The main thing that gives me hope is that the God I know and the God I serve is more powerful than anything else that's going on. And as my mom used to say, she says this all the time, something crazy happens and we get all crazy, she says, and God didn't get off his throne either. God is still on the throne. Nothing that has happened shook God enough that he's not still in control. And that gives me hope. Secondly, um, the fact that there has been so much unity as, as Pastor stated, um, and that people have been honest, the honesty that has come forth, even when it's uncomfortable, um, there has been such a denial about what is going on for so long. And the honesty of people saying, you know what, it's me, I'm one of them. 
I, I didn't know it. I didn't see it before, but it's me. It's me. That moves things. That changes things. Because until we can say, I know that this is a problem and I am involved, I've participated, I've benefited from this system, I've been a part of this system, until that is spoken and felt nothing we can't there's there's nowhere to go there has to be this brutal honesty and it is uncomfortable it's uncomfortable for everybody it's uncomfortable for everybody but until the words are spoken and until it is accepted and until people say it's not up to those people out there to change it's not up to those people out there to fix it it's 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 personal it has to be personal. And I think that one thing that gives me hope about this situation particularly, and, and the point that we've arrived at now, is that it seems to be no longer viewed as just a Black problem. This is a people problem. It's not Black people's problem. It's not those, those poor Black people, those, oh, those people, this is how those people, this is a human problem. This is a humanity problem. It's not just them. And I, that's the biggest thing about this whole situation is everybody wants to do this. This is like the most comfortable position. This is, they should make a dance or something that looks like, this is, this is everybody wants to do this. This is our thing. And nobody wants to look inside. And black people too, let me be clear, because we, we got stuff. I've heard as many racist remarks and jokes from black people as I have heard about black people. So let's be clear, everybody needs to examine themselves. Everybody needs to do the work. But the fact that those conversations, that this conversation is happening and that there are people willing to say, it's me and I'm here to listen and we gotta figure this out. That gives me hope. Thank you, Dana Wayne. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, I just had to unmute again. The one thing that gives me hope is the number one thing is my faith in the God that I serve. I think, I don't think, I know that the God that I serve, he looks upon all of us. And he does not look at us in a biased way. Forget about the denomination, the, the religious belief. We're all God's children. If I don't have anything, I have faith in God. The other thing that I hold great and near dear to my heart is my relationship with the Jewish community. 99.9 .9 of my support comes from the Jewish community. The Jewish community is the one who stepped out and said, hey, Wayne, come go to us, with us to Israel. We want you to go to Israel and we will make it accommodating for you. That has been the best thing that ever happened to me. To be able to go to Israel and walk on the pages of the Bible, that gave me a lot of faith. Not only to be baptized in the Jordan River, but to know that my brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith really, truly cares. Not just about me, but about the whole community. And over the years, the Jewish community has stood side by side with me and made many, many contributions to my organization. I would not be here today without that support. A dream, a vision is great, but if you don't have the people who put their financial support behind you, all you have is a dream. So my hope is instilled 
in the relationship that I have with the Jewish community. I strongly bury my faith and my hope and unity in the community. I have been involved with Temple Bethel for over 30 years. Over 30 years. I, it's a long list of things that we've done together. I'm not going to bore you with that tonight. But these are the people who have stepped over the line and said, Wayne, for I, for I live, for you live, I'll die. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. And not just saying it, but truly acting on it. That gives me hope. That gives me hope to strive, to continue to push on, and try to save our young people. Before I close out, I just want to say that we need to look at the housing. We need to look at health care. We need to look at education when it comes to racism. There's so many things out there in our world and society that is just not fair. I don't know if it's meant to not to be fair. I don't know if it's designed that way. But I can tell you, there's no way that a kid at Boca Elementary who goes to an institution of education to receive a different level of education, a kid that goes to Pinecrest. I love Pinecrest. But if you look at what Boca Elementary is putting out and what Pinecrest in the same grade, the same age group kids, it's not, it's not equal. It's not fair. How do we change that? How do we look at our healthcare system and allow Afro-Americans to receive the same health care as one who's not Afro-American? How do we look at the housing? How do we change housing? Dixon Manor is the only public housing in Boca. At one point, that's where the black soldiers lived at. They couldn't live on the military base. There was segregation implemented at that time, so they, they put them off the base. You can fight for the same cause. You can fight for something that you don't even know what you're fighting for or you, or you signed up for but you cannot stay on the military base. When FAU was a military base with the Marines, the Army, the Navy, there was segregation. So the black soldiers had to live in Dixie Manor. But they can go on the front line and fight the same war, fight the same fight, but we can't eat at the same table. And they're still treating the people in Dixie Manor the same way. Nothing has changed. So I ask you today to look at the housing. If we can just hold on to hope, every individual have their own individual hope. If we can just hold on to it. And if we save one little girl, we save a generation of babies that won't be incarcerated, that won't be on death row. A whole generation of babies. In lieu of being on death row or the jail row, you'll be on some college honor roll if we just save one little girl. So again, I'm saying to you guys, what is hope? Hope is unity in the community, what we're doing here. That's the only hope that keeps me going for so many years, fighting the fight, going when I don't want to go. That's sometimes I just cry in the middle of the night. I wake up like last night. I woke up 3 o'clock in the morning. And I just began to pray. There's just so much pain for my people, so much pain. The Jewish community and the black community have been through so much historically. I continue to ask God, why so much pain? And he replies to me, 
Why not? I want your attention. I want you to focus on me. And that's what we're doing. So I encourage everyone who's listening tonight to find your hope. Don't ever get up on your hope. Hang on to your hope, whatever it is that's going to get us through it. But the first we have to be, again, and I don't mean to be repetitious, we first have to look each other in the face. And we have to be honest with one another. And like the sister said before me, it's going to make you feel uncomfortable, but keep it real. And we'll bring about change. Thank you. So many are asking in the Q&A, what can we do? Many in our Jewish community want to help and be supportive allies. What advice would you offer them? Dana, if you want to start, and then Pastor, then Wayne. Um. So I've been asked this by a couple of of friends. And the first thing I want to say is, if you look around, take inventory in your life, and you only see people that look like you, there's a problem. Statistically speaking, there are enough Black people here in this country and in this community that your world should not be all white. If it is, you need to look at whether or not that's been by design, whether or not that's been intentional. A lot of people um, say that um, whether it was people with disabilities, veterans, um, LGBT community, whatever, interracial marriage, that there are these issues that people feel very strongly about or very strongly against until they meet somebody that's gay or that's disabled or that's a veteran or that's black. If, if you don't have some frame of reference, if you don't have a real person, real people, cause then let's not do the, like I got my one black friend. Don't do that. Okay. So if you don't have, people in your life that you can relate to, that can show you this other side, that can show you what these experiences mean. They're just abstract concepts and they won't mean anything. And I think that it's very difficult to gain perspective when you're in your your isolated bubble. So one thing that I have suggested to people and, and what I think is really important is to diversify your life. And if that means intentionally finding ways to integrate people that don't look like you into your life, do it. I had to, I said this to somebody earlier and they said, well, you know, a lot of um, white people like live in the suburbs and it's all white. So none of my friends live in my neighborhood. We all have people that we love and care about and spend time with that are not in our neighbor. I don't care what your neighborhood is. Go to a store in a different part of town. Do your shopping somewhere else. Find activities and events that not just you, that your children can be involved in to force them in environments where everyone doesn't look like them. It's, to me, one of the most, so that is important. More importantly than that is for people to really be honest with themselves and do some real digging. I think, I I think there are a bunch of practical um, ideas and things that I can come up with and do this and do this and do this. And I've said this even about um, laws because people say, well, we need to vote and you can do this, but voting is what's important. And I've said this over and over and I will say it again. You can't legislate people's hearts. We can change rules. Yes, we can. But you can't legislate hearts. We do the heart work. I think all the other stuff is, is kind of, yeah. you know, I, I think it's, it has to, it has to be real, honest, hard, uncomfortable work. And then finding people that you can connect with that can show you this other experience and show you this other side. Your world should not just look like you and you will never gain perspective as long as it does. 
Thank you, Pastor. It's an interesting question. What can they do to help? I believe this type of a question, we need to keep as simple as possible, the answer. And the answer is to get involved, to make yourselves available. And have the most important thing is to have a sincere, a sincere desire to see and to bring about a change, to be involved. And, 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 and I say sincere and a desire because so many people get involved for the wrong reason, for the wrong purpose, for political gains, or just for show, or just to say that uh, I was there. And I think that the church needs to be the hub or the focal point of change. It's unfortunate, it's unfortunate that and I think one of the reasons why we find ourselves here again is because seemingly like every time one of these atrocities happen, a young black male is dead, got killed or a female or whomever, it seems like it's the focal point for two weeks. And after those two weeks, you never hear about anything else until the next one happens. So I think what we need to do is to be consistent and to get involved, but more so make yourselves available. We make ourselves available for anything we wanna do. So where, where's our priorities? If we want to, it seems like it's more important to try to get the NBA or NFL or sports or anything back online, get to come, get everything in the economy back online, every state opening up, even though the pandemic is still around us, where is our priorities? We need to put our priorities where life is. We need to put our priorities on a consistent basis. And I, I as the pastor of Ebenezer, I, I pledge to work with anyone that's willing to work together for a cause and to help out because I agree with Willie, I, I would agree, I would agree with Wayne that education, education is a must. Training is a must, is a must. And as I said before, we can't put everything on the police department, but we, what we can do is come together, work together, and if we come together and work together, guess what? They'll be serving a community that feels the same and expects the same and demand to be treated the same. You look out for me, I look out for you. Then the police department have to look out for us. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Mr. Barton. I think he's on you, mute. Oh, he's on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I wanna say thank you to the Jewish community for willing to step up and say, how can I help? What can we do? I, I got a few things in mind what the Jewish community can do and, and hopefully they would embrace it. And that is within your own Jewish faith, identify who wants to come and support the black community in such ways of formulating a committee from Temple Bethel and having the concern about what's happening with Pearl City, our only black community in Boca. Pretty soon we won't have a black community in Boca. It's only eight blocks. And what has happened over the years and the deterioration of our community, investors that came in and bought up all the property, it's called connecting the dots. Do you have a minority face that sits on the porch, but you have an investor or white owner that owns the property? 
And eventually when the right price is on the right table, it's gonna wipe out that community. Years ago, Pearl City was considered as colored time, town. And there was no way other place in Boca you could buy land if you was Afro-American. Alex Hughes was the first Afro-American to buy land in Boca Raton. That's why the park is called Hughes Park behind Florence Fuller Child Development Center. Florence Fuller Child Development Center was a community center for that neighborhood at one point. Slowly but surely, piece by piece, that community is getting picked apart and it won't exist. The south side where Ebenezer Baptist Church is on Glaze Road in the fire department, that is under the historical uh, uh, the historical part of the community where it's registered in Tallahassee, but the north side isn't. Getting with the Jewish community to identify why Pro City get treated different than any other community in Boca Raton. If we could put together committees to look at the, again, the education, the housing, and even lobby Tallahassee to find out how we can empower our black community. That is how you can help. We're not looking for a handout. We're looking up for a hand up. How can we empower them to be self-sufficient? That is what I would like to see the Jewish community do. Step up, stand side by side with us, and make it right, what hasn't been right for so many years. And that's the thing that needs to be done in Pearl City, a very small Afro-American community in Boca, so that we can be able to be grounded in the community and know that we won't be removed. Because we had such a critical time in Pearl City that the time is of the essence. And pretty soon there will be no Pearl City. And you ask the city of Boca Raton, the city council, the mayor, what is your plan for Pearl City? What are your intentions with it? They'll look you in the face and say to you, we don't have a plan. You have a plan for downtown development. You got time for the, the, the beach district. You got town for midtown, uptown. All these things are popping up. You have a plan for that. So the only Afro-American community you have in Boca Raton, which is only eight blocks, you don't have a plan for that? Well, you know what, Mayor? I find that very hard to believe. There's a problem with that. So we need the Jewish community to stand side by side with us and look our city councils in the face and say, how can we increase the quality of life for our Afro-American community? and then set examples for other cities all over. We're in trouble. If if the Jewish community don't help us to help ourselves, there will be no Pearl City in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Dana. It's, It's really hard for rabbis to sit and be quiet and to listen. Um, and I've been trying for weeks and weeks to do a better job of listening. One thing that I plan to do is uh, when the recording of this is made available on our website, on our Facebook page, to go back and listen to it all over again, because what the three of you shared tonight was there were so many kernels of pain and of fear and of hope and of possibility and of opportunity that it was impossible for me to hold them all in my head at one time and i want to go back and listen again i want to thank the three of you from the bottom of my heart and from the bottom of our hearts for agreeing to be on this panel tonight and to really open yourselves up to the members of our community some of you we've had relationships that go back years and decades and Pastor Brown, you went on a limb to join us tonight. We don't know each other very well. I really, really appreciate the friendship that you and I have built and we've built over these last couple of months. And I look forward to tonight being the first of many, many conversations around what we can do together. To Wayne, I'm going to say that you just tell me when that meeting is going to be. And I promise you there will be a group of people from Temple Bethel, that committee that you called for, because there are so many people in our community who are interested in doing just as you said, for us to stand 
alongside and behind in support of the African-American community that with your leadership, the two of you and, and Dana, what you have demonstrated tonight with us and is who you've always been, which is a woman who speaks from her heart and shares and wears on her sleeve her emotions and is open to the world in ways so that we can learn from your Torah of the life that you have lived. Um, there are so many members of our community who are impassioned by all of this and who have shared with us the pain over the last couple of weeks and the confusion and the and, and the anger and and the sense of we know that we we know that our tradition calls us to be a part of the solution to this but we don't know where to start and i think that tonight is just the start just the beginning of a series of conversations hopefully sooner or later in person and not on zoom although it'll probably be the reality for some time i do want to share with our community that um in a couple of weeks we're going to be, be beginning a book discussion of dr abram x kendi's book how to be an anti-racist some of you have already signed up online to be a part of that there's information on our website to learn more about what are some of the underlying issues of race in our country that we should be educating ourselves about to make us better partners uh, and supporters in this struggle um it has been a very powerful evening uh I know that I think many of us uh, are at the end of what we're able to absorb tonight. And so, and again, it is with just deep gratitude to the three of you and with gratitude to the members of our community who joined this conversation to be passive listeners um, that I say to the three of you, thank you so very much uh, and wish everyone a good night.